All right, welcome everybody to the Road Trip Nation panel from System Impacted to Impacting the System. Uh, we are super excited today to have the, the world debut of the formerly incarcerated Road Trip, also known as Being Free. Uh, it doesn't debut on PBS until August 1st, but um, the ASU GSV Summit has particular significance to us as, at Road Trip Nation. Um, at the ASU GSV Summit is actually where this entire project was birthed. Uh, where I think, was it three years ago? Was that? which is just crazy to think about with the pandemic and everything. But yeah, it was three years ago. Um, we were out in front of our huge green motorhome right out front. And a guy by the name of Ali Tambura walks up to the motorhome. And he says, hey, is this, is this Road Trip Nation? And we said, yeah, have you heard about it before? And uh, I'll actually let him tell his own story about it. But that was the, uh, we're just uh, so grateful for the partnership with uh, then Chan Zuckerberg, now Stand Together, and, 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 and uh, now the Just Trust and Stand Together, and also Strata Education Network for making this possible. Um, and I also just want to thank, um, most importantly, our three road trippers. Um, this past year, during the pandemic, or when the pandemic was beginning to recede, um, these three incredible road trippers joined Road Trip Nation on the road for about a month and went across America interviewing system-impacted individuals and career pathways all across America to learn about their personal journeys, the paths they've taken, and the insights they've learned to get to where they are today. Um, and I want to introduce our panelists now, and I also want to thank just our, the team at Road Trip Nation who has been working tirelessly on this project to get this ready for this all night long. Um, but, uh, you know, particularly right now, with as we're emerging from COVID, um, and just, you know, the impact, the impact of stories of resiliency. And if there's one thing that we can learn from these road trippers and their personal journeys, um, it's just a model for all of us in terms of, you know, workforce adaptability, agility, but really just incredible perseverance. And we're just, we're so grateful for your stories and for your um, trust in Road Trip Nation. Uh, and we're just really excited to share your, your stories with the world. So um, first up, I just want to introduce London Crowdy. Uh, she's co-founder of Unapologetically Hers and one of our road trippers from earlier this year. <laughs> Next up, we have Cordero Holmes, uh, who is a student ambassador from Rio Salado College in Arizona. If you haven't heard of Rio Salado, an incredibly innovative um, college that really meets students kind of where they are and, and helps um, all types of learners get their, helps them through their post-secondary journeys. Uh, and then, of course, Hugo Gonzalez from Long Beach. Uh, Hugo, you're going to hear more from him later, but just an amazing human and a transformational coach, alumni coordinator for success stories, and of course, one of our road trippers from, from earlier this year. Um, so thanks, Cordero and Hugo. I also want to introduce Vikrant Reddy from Stand Together. So Stand Together Trust has been a really critical partner um, on this project and helped us launch a community hub where individuals interested in this cause can help kind of take action along driving social stigmas and shifting the narrative around, around, um, around these pathways. And then of course, Ali Tambura, um, just our friend and coach and mentor and guide throughout this entire journey, um, formerly at Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, now at the Just Trust and has been really just like the spirit and the driver and the gas pedal behind this whole thing. So thank you for teaching us and uh, kind of bringing us all here. We're all here because of you, so thank you for that. And then uh, last but not least is Nicole Woodworth from Road Trip Nation. She's been, her and um, Ryan Perkins and Craig Pobleski from Road Trip Nation have been like the drivers for this from our side for years on this project. So I'll, I'll pass it off to the team and um, thanks again to all of you, so. Thank you, Mike. And thank you so much to those of you who are here in person with us this morning and for those tuning into the live stream. There's a lot competing, I think, for our time and attention these days. And so just your presence and attention to this conversation means a lot. So thank you for being here. So I would like to start um, with our road trippers, London, Cordero, Hugo. What is or what was your favorite part of the whole road trip experience, whether it was an interview that stood out to you, a favorite memory, um, even a particular place that you visited that stood out. I wanna start there of just what stands out in your mind as, as a highlight from the road trip. In London, we'll start with you and then Cordero and Hugo. Hello. Okay. Thank you for that question, Nicole. Um, so my favorite part of the road trip for sure it was so many good memories, honestly. It's really hard to pick one. It's really hard to pick just one individual that we interviewed because I felt like they were just, everybody just was doing amazing work and brought so much to the table. But my personal, like really touched my heart is that we were able to interview a young woman named Jamie Elwood. And Jamie Elwood, um, 
was is a, a dear friend of mine that I actually did time with. So we did about five years together, and she's just always been an amazing spirit, just an amazing human human being. And be able to like do time together, go through that period of like loss, uh, trauma, you know, tears, all those types of things, and like be sitting together inside and planning our future and thinking about like life after prison. And then to, for the first time, see her, because she lives in Louisiana. And so I wasn't able to see her prior to that. And so with the Road Trip Nation show, I was able to see her and just to see the life that she was building for herself. She had a child and being able to see each other just on the other side was truly, um, yeah, it was an emotional moment for me, but it was also like just beautiful in every way for me as well. Full circle. Yeah, full yeah. circle. Thank you for sharing. Cordero? Um, <clears throat> like, like London said, it was so many great memories. We interviewed fantastic people. Uh, we just had a fantastic time. But if it was a time, it was definitely just getting to know London and, and Hugo. And if, if it's, a, if it's a, a, a point that I could like point to, it was just seeing Jamie with London and knowing that L- Jamie knew London, the same London that I know. And that happened in just a short period of time. So it's not about the quantity, it's about the quality. And I know that London was genuine. That's who London is. Everything that we built together was authentic. And the same with Hugo and Scott Budnick, who was uh, one of the reasons why, you know, he's been released, but I'm gonna let Hugo tell the story. (laughs) But um, just to see them interact with each other and know that, you know, that's the same Hugo I know. And I just met Hugo. And so just the genuineness and build these relationships that just didn't just began on that road trip, but went after. And, you know, now we still talk often. So that was the best part of it. I love y'all. <laughs> Thanks, Cordero. Thanks, Hugo. Michael. Is this on? Um, the mic giving me a flashback of karaoke last night. <laughs> so um, I, used, I used to watch Road Trip, Trip Nation and uh, when I was in Soledad, uh, they, it would come on on Saturday mornings before they released for Yard. And I remember I would watch this show and I tripped out that, you know, kids would jump on this RV. They would allow them to drive this big ass RV. And, but, but more importantly, like they're able to travel. And that was something that, that, that I never really got to do when I was out. But um, I, I was able to fantasize about like where I would want to go, like where I would want to go if I was in that RV. And then the, the weirdest, craziest thing happened. Fast forward, I'm actually in the, sa- in the same RV that I used to fantasize, not actually driving or traveling on, but just being able to travel. Um, and for me, I would say that one of my greatest memories, like, of course, getting to meet new people and getting to meet authentic people that, that relate with my perspective, but the Grand Canyon. The Grand Canyon, I, I, I used to feel, was just this overrated hole uh, on this planet that people just go and see and it's like, okay, what's the point? But I went and I, I know what the point is now. Like it made me feel so small. I'm so used to hearing people say that this world is small because our way of thinking or my way of thinking was so constricted uh, uh, in, within walls. And now I was able to actually look at this scenery that just looked fake. It looked so beautiful that it was fake. It looked fake. and. Uh, it, may, it reminded me of how unbelievable life is. And it reminded me of how fortunate I am to be able to have the experiences that I'm experiencing even up to this very moment. So I, I love you all, seriously. It's beautiful, thank you. Another question that I have for the three of you is, and maybe it, um, it coincides with what you all just shared, but was there a particular kind of epiphany moment or a light bulb moment during the road trip um, that that you had, that you would feel comfortable sharing. Um, London, I'll start with you again. Uh, For sure. So for me, uh, I'm so thankful that these two guys right here were good drivers (laughs) because, um, yes, I've the entire trip, I probably in total drove the RV for about 20 minutes. (laughs) And that was enough for me. And so... With that being said, that gave me a lot of time to like sit at the window um, and reflect. 
And what happens is, as soon as you get out of prison, you just have to hit the ground running, right? You need a job, you need resources, you need to figure out a place to live, work, et cetera. And so you don't really have a moment to like really pause and just realize like what you just came out of. It's like the world has this expectation of uh, you should just be able to come out of, the, out of that environment and just be able to shake it off and you know keep it moving. And that's what I had to do. And so being on the road trip, it was the one time that it was just me. I couldn't take care of anybody else but me. And like being able to look out that window, I mean, there was times I was like, oh God, I hope they don't think I'm crazy because I would just like burst out into tears or just like be in solitude with myself. Just, you know, it's so easy to like bury things and that hinders you, right? And so it gave me an opportunity, like the best was like self-reflection and self-reflection gave me the courage to actually do what I'm doing now, which is like moving on from my career path and trying to like really figure out like what does London want to do? What's next for me? Like, who am I? So I was able to ask like those critical questions to myself and like had that space and energy to do it. That space is so important, right? Yeah, it's super. Cordero? <clears throat> an epiphany moment. Um, we, were in, we were in Selma, Alabama, and uh, we got the opportunity to walk the bridge, right? And I remember knowing that we were gonna go there and was expecting to feel something, right? To, to feel like greatness, because I know greatness walked that bridge. And um, I, didn't get, I didn't get that. And I, I recognized that it was in the, like, great people who walked this bridge and fought for uh, the things that, you know, so often, especially from the environment in which I come from, we, we, we think little of. But as we drove 45 minutes from Selma to Montgomery and we were passing these cotton fields, it hit me. It hit that feeling that I was looking for on that bridge, I felt on that drive to Montgomery because it was like an intergenerational connection. I seen those cotton fields and I know that my ancestors were in those cotton fields. And I know that the same individuals that walked that bridge walked that 45 minute drive from Selma to Montgomery. And it really made me just ponder about some of the things that we do say as far as like voting, because oftentimes we feel like it doesn't matter who you vote for, it doesn't matter, right? Because they're gonna do what they're gonna do and they're gonna do it regardless and, and, and without thought of who, us, where I come from, my people. And, uh, <clears throat> and, um, to know that they did that, they picked cotton in those cotton fields so that those folks could take that walk to go to make sure that we could vote. It really, it really, conf I was conflicted. Because I was, I was, I was, con I, was I, I knew that the, a lot of the stuff that I was saying was was BS, right? And so it really just encouraged me to really, if they would do all that stuff, right, to so that we could vote, I need to really start taking advantage of that because I thought so little of it. And so um, while I was on this trip, I was on probation. And um, I, I recently just got off in December. So no more probation. <laughs> and um, thank you. Yeah. So uh, one of the things that I know I'm gonna do is as soon as I can, if the first opportunity I can, I can go and get my rights back, I'm definitely gonna get those back and I'm gonna utilize uh, all of those rights and just take advantage of them and make sure that I encourage those in my environment to do that too. So that was the epiphany that, you know, what we, what we say in our vote, it does matter. It's really powerful. Thank you for, thank you for that, Cordero. Hugo? I would, I would, I would, I agree with both of them. Uh, London was mentioning having the space. Like, I, I wasn't allotted, I wasn't allowed to have the space of actually wondering what I want to do and then take it from there. The moment I got out, my biggest date, my biggest fantasy, my biggest dream was to get out of prison. And I really didn't think about what I would do after that. Because this dream that I had really felt like I was fantasizing. And when it actually happened, I just, I found myself out here. And it was like, just be grateful, just be grateful. And um, the work that I'm doing, just be grateful. And then it, th this trip really gave me, and I might get fired after this one. <laughs> but this trip really gave me the opportunity to really think about what I want to do. And um, at, currently, uh, my current job is actually going into prison, motivating individuals that they could do it as well. 
But the truth is I never give myself the space to actually recognize that these, these are the same places that traumatized me and that I was daydreaming on wanting to get out of. And now I'm finding myself taking long drives back into. And um, it really, really got, gave me the space to really think about what I want. Um, Cordero brought something up about the cotton fields. I remember we were in New Orleans and you know, New Orleans is a beautiful city, wild, beautiful. Um, there was this cannon and, and they celebrate this cannon, the same cannon that they used in the Mexican War, which was not even like a war, it wasn't even that long. And um, it just made me feel like, damn, like we celebrate this and I really didn't question it before. And for the first time in my life, I found in myself questioning things, like not, not only what I want, but like what surrounds me and what are the opportunities that, that are out there for me. Um, my aha moment was, was interviewing uh, Ken, Ken Oliver, and being able to see the same individual that I was with in the same prison yard, and then uh, being able to celebrate with him, not only his success, but the, the truth that I'm looking and witnessing as far as like individuals like Ali and him, being able to be someone in this world that's effective and creating a narrative that goes beyond just this room. Creating a narrative that isn't just applauded one minute and then the moment we exit is just forgotten. Like actually creating fuel to something that needs fuel and being able to humanize people that are demonized constantly. Um, yeah, so it really did open a lot for me and I appreciate you, my boy. For those on the live stream who maybe can't see, Ken's in the audience right now. I'm glad to have you here. It's interesting, Hugo and London, both of you talk about the road trip giving you the opportunity for space to reflect, to be introspective, to start questioning things. Um, and I think that's really powerful and oftentimes not a gift that we give ourselves too often or are afforded. Um, I'd like to turn the conversation to my friend Ali here. And Ali, if you could share, I guess in your own, um, in your own words, what it was like <laughs> that day, seeing the green RV here three years ago at ASU GSV, meeting Mike, and um, if you would be um, open to sharing um, some of your story, too. I, I can just sum it up one word, amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, my name's Lee Tambora. I, uh, I was a program officer at the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative and had the privilege of coming here and speaking uh, three years ago. And um, I'm also formally incarcerated. And um, I walked out the front door um, and I saw this big green RV and I was like, same thing. I watched the show when I was uh, uh, in San Quentin State Prison and uh, I was just being nosy, you know, peeking around, looking through the windows and, and Mike popped out and he's like, can I help you? And you actually look just like my buddy that I used to cut school with and go surfing in Santa Cruz. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, it's Charlie. Um, but he's got the same kind of laid back. Like, and we started talking, and, and I, there was just like this bond instantly. Um, I don't know if it was because I was like, I watched the show religiously, you know, but, but uh, I, I just, it just felt comfortable. He invited me in, I started telling my story. Um, he, he's, he's like, you were in prison? Like, like, how were you a program officer? And I went through that whole story and, and um, how I got into this role. And then we went and had some Starbucks across the street and we just started, I don't know, it was just a weird thing. I'm like, you know, between, I don't know who brought it up first, but it was like, why don't we get three formerly incarcerated people on the road trip, have them go across the United States so we can show America that like we're people. And, and you know, there's 2.2 million people in our prisons and, and 600,000 people get released from our prisons and jails every year. Um, about a third of the population in this country is system impacted in one way or have, some, have been touched by the criminal legal system. And I thought like, we've really got to start, you know, we work in a lot of areas around policy change, but to do that policy and advocacy, to do that right, we need to change the narrative. And we need to have America see um, that we are a community. Um, and a community of leaders. I mean, frankly, when I started at CZI and they asked me what I wanted to do, I said I wanted to support formerly incarcerated leaders across the United States, and it was, it was crickets in the room. You know, it's like, you wanna give millions of dollars to people who have been convicted of crimes? And I'm like, yeah! They're the people who, who are closest to the issue, who know how to change 
the best way to, to, to decarcerate safely in our nation. And so the project was born. Um, I went back to my office and found out I, I didn't quite have enough money in, in our coffers, uh, in our budget. Um, so started looking for partners and um, at the Stand Together people came. And it's just, it just a wonderful thing. This is probably the, my favorite, it is my favorite project that I've done um, since I've been home. And um, it's, you know, I'm not a jealous person. I'm not starstruck. Um, but I was really freaking jealous that I didn't go on the, I, I couldn't go on the trip. I was like, these guys got to go. I, wa I wanted to be on that RV with you guys laughing and having fun. Um, but it's, it's, it's been an amazing journey. And like, I'm so proud of, of, of everybody. Um, the Road Trip Nation people have just been phenomenal. Um, Nicole and managing this whole project, um, the road trippers. I'm, I'm chomping at the bit to see some of this footage. Um, but yeah, that's kind of how it started. And um, it's, it's a great turn of events to be back on the same stage. Yeah. And actually yesterday I was looking for the RV. I found it. It's on this side. <laughs> really full circle. Thanks for sharing that. And I think that Mike might have teed this up at the beginning, but we're going to close out the session today um, by showcasing the trailer for the, for the film for the first time. So... Stay tuned, you get to see some footage. Um, Vikrant, just turning the conversation to you, as someone who studies and writes about public policy reform as it relates to this topic, I'm curious for you, or if you would be able to share um, some of your own insights and learnings um, about public policy reform, the importance of it as it relates to this topic, and in your opinion and from your point of view, um, what types of reform is most urgently needed right now? Gosh, everybody has been so inspirational. I'm kind of like the eat your vegetables part of the panel here. Right? <laughs> I just ta I'd start talking about laws. But, uh, but they are important, and that's a big part of what's going to help get people back on their feet is, is really getting the law right. And I think you guys could all testify to this. When you come out from behind bars, there is just a mountain of obstacles in your way. And you know the cultural obstacles we've been talking about a little bit on the panel here, and, and those are very, very difficult to overcome. But you would hope that the legal obstacles, the obstacles put in place by government are things that we could get rid of pretty quickly. Uh, you asked for some examples. I'll give you just three that are basically paperwork problems. This is just paperwork. We should be able to do this very easily. Number one, when you get out from behind bars, you should get to have an ID. It is so difficult to just get an ID, and you can't do anything in this country without an ID. Uh, I'm about to go to the airport after this. They're not going to let me on the plane without the ID. I, I don't think I picked up my badge here without showing my ID. You can't do anything without just having an ID. And it is so difficult to get one. In my home state of Texas, for a little while there, they may still do this. Remember, Texas is a gigantic state. It's the second biggest state in the Union after Alaska. There was one van that would just drive around a little, like, laminating machine that would make the cards for people. You know how long it takes to get from El Paso to Houston? I think it's like 13 hours or something. This is insanity that something that simple, just getting people ID, can't be done more uh, efficiently and effectively. Secondly, this is kind of a, a component of the first one. Getting people driver's licenses. Usually ID and driver's licenses are the same things, but sometimes they're distinct. And if you're in a rural area in particular, you need to be able to have your driver's license. I understand you can make an argument if the underlying offense that sent you behind bars is something that's driving related. But if it wasn't, the idea that you would come out and you would have this record, maybe you've got you know various kinds of small misdemeanors and things that have caused you to rack up different fines and stuff like that, and for that reason, you're not allowed to get a driver's license, I can't tell you how much that holds you back, especially, like I said, in a rural or even just suburban area. You cannot get to work without a car. You have to be able to drive. Very few people in this country are living in places that have got great uh, mass transit where you can just get on the train, get on the metro, and get to, get to your job. You can't do it without a car. You got to get people driver's license. The third one I'll note is uh, occupational licenses. We've got all these, frankly, just sort of ridiculous licenses in the country uh, to, get, uh, to be able to enter into all kinds of professions. They're simply not necessary. They get put up by these groups of professions that are, I hate to use this word, but they're basically like cartels. They're just trying to keep competition out. So as a small example, uh, say you want to cut hair, you want to become a barber. 
the barbers all get together and they say, well, you know, if you want to be a barber, you can't have a record. Well, you've got, uh, again, I, I embarrassed to note this about my home state of Texas, but for a long time there, we were teaching people behind bars how to cut hair because it was a useful skill. It's something you do when you come out from behind bars and you find out that, well, even if they taught you all of this, you're not allowed to get the barber's license anyway because the barber cartel got together and said that formerly incarcerated people can't have the license. It's barbering, there's cosmetology, electrician, there's, I could go on and on and name dozens and dozens and dozens of professions like this. You should be able to get those laws off the book, off the books, excuse me. Again, these are just legal obstacles that are in the way and they ought to just be paperwork problems that we can get rid of. The cultural problems are you know, a much bigger issue. The things like Road Trip Nation help a lot in solving those problems, by the way. But the legal stuff, I, I would hope we could fix those problems pretty quickly. Thanks for that. I'm curious too for Vikrant and Ali, can you both speak to um, the importance of second chance hiring? Um, and for those that may not be aware that simply just hiring formerly incarcerated individuals. So can you speak to maybe um, why companies are, are embracing that? And for companies that aren't, why they should be? Um, Ali, I can start with you. Sure. Um you know, that's actually why I was here three years ago, was talking about um, um, second chance hiring and hiring people who are coming out of our prisons and jails. Um, just like the, the legal barriers, um, there's stigma. Like you get this star scarlet letter, you know, that, that basically says you can't change. You are this person, and I challenge everybody in this audience to think of the worst thing you've ever done in your life. Don't tell me. Don't tell anybody if you didn't get caught. But, but think of that. Think of the worst thing you've ever done in your life. Maybe you were upset. Maybe you stole a candy bar, whatever. And someone labeled you for the rest of your life. That's who you were. You're a little Billy who stole the candy bar. You're a thief. And for your whole life, that's how someone's going to look at you. And, and for employers, they don't know. You know, it, it's been kind of this, it, it's part of our culture that, that, People who have been convicted of a crime can't change. And that's why we have this road trip nation. And, and getting back to your question, you know, most employers who have hired someone who was formerly incarcerated will tell you that that's the best employee they've ever had. We are hungry to work when we come home. We need to work when we come home. Um, and so, and we're slowly seeing um, companies change their mind about this. You know, I, I work uh, in San Francisco with, with Slack and some other companies that, that are, they have a program to train formerly incarcerated people to go in the tech industry. And that's actually how I got in, into my job. So your question is about the, uh, the importance of, of second chances and, and hiring uh, formerly incarcerated people and why companies should care. I think I know what I'm supposed to say. I'm supposed to say that, you know, it's the moral thing to do. You want to give people second chances. It's about the common good. And I believe all those things. But let's face it, we're talking about corporations here. And so we have to pitch them on the business reason to want to do this. We have to pitch them on the profit-seeking reason. But I think there's a real argument to be made there also. Because if you talk to people who are involved in hiring, you talk to people in HR, you talk to anybody who started a business that's just trying to hire an administrative assistant, they will all tell you the same thing. Gosh, it's hard to find good people. Oh my gosh, it's so difficult. And we have all of our basic ways of doing this, and we go to the same kinds of websites and databases and things like that to do the same kinds of resume collection. But it's quite frequently not working. And so we've got to find new places to hire people. We've got to find areas where we haven't looked in the past because hopefully you can get creative thinking people, people who maybe have had experiences and been uh, in parts of the world and parts of American life that uh, we may not have thought of, but that help them be really, really effective in their jobs because they're just different and they can think differently, they can think creatively. And who, by the way, may have skills that are really, really impressive. They just kind of got directed in the, in the wrong way. So, I, mean, I hate to put it this way, but you meet a drug dealer, you might be impressed by the business savvy these guys have got. I mean, they know a lot about supply chains and identifying markets and things like this at kind of an intuitive level. But how do you find a way to take that skill set and put it into something productive rather than something 
uh, counterproductive. All of that stuff is out there, and you find these people and you develop these talents, you can hire really good people and, yeah, make more money at your company. I think that's the case. Thank you both. Um, in the remaining few minutes that we have left, I want to turn it back to the three of you, the road trippers. And, you know, there's a lot of people here in person now tuning in online who have the resources and the power to um, affect change, really positive change um, on the criminal legal system and for system impacted people. So in, in your own words, uh, I would like for you to share what is one thing that you want them to take away from this conversation, your own life experience. Um, I just wanna turn the floor to you. And Hugo, I know that <laughs> you've gone last of the three, the last couple of questions. So I'd like to start with you, if that's okay. I would say essentially um, question everything. Like don't just leave um, an opinion as an opinion, like question, like why do people do what they do? It's, it's in questioning that we give ourselves the opportunity to understand. And it's through understanding that we have the, um, the option, not the obligation, but the option to have compassion. And it's through that compassion that we're able to come up with real solutions instead of bandages to things that we may consider solutions. And that, that I hope, covers it all. Because now anyone that's looking at me or anyone up here could actually question it, ask why. Get an understanding of the individual that you're actually wanting to know more about and then really honestly have that compassion that comes with, with the solution as well. And together we could honestly make this a better place as, as fairy tale as that may sound. Thanks, Hugo. Cordero? Um, down from well, a, a lot of individuals who are incarcerated come from an environment where, you know, they didn't have those resources. So for folks who have those resources, uh, I'm, I'm going to give you a little sneak peek because London said this. She said awesome things can happen when you give an individual some resources. And you see it right here. Ali, Hugo, myself, London, Ken. And, and a, a plethora of different other individuals. If you look into, you're gonna see. And the reason why, we should, we should be hired. So just um, use those resources in order to make the whole better. London. Yeah, thank you for that, Cordell. And I, that's where I would just really leave from, you know, that when you treat somebody like they matter, that they're important, like a human being, like you'll be so surprised that magical things can happen. And, you know, I don't have the statistics down as well as Ali, right? But knowing, I think he said, what, over 2 million people right now in America right now that's locked up. So public safety is all of our issue, right? And so when people who are return, uh, California has one of the highest recidivism rates. And so when you release someone and you don't give them realistic resources to take care of themselves, you know, it's, it's easy to go and derail back into that path because people are trying to survive. And also what we were speaking about uh, is proximate leadership. You know, people who are closest to the pain are closest to the solution. So hire them, hire them. You know, we have uh, JFF, right? So they hired Ali, who's formerly incarcerated, who knew that, one, who to give the money to. I met Ali when I first came home on the steps of Sacramento uh, at an a, a event called Quest for Democracy, where he was leading and giving other organizations who had the boots on the ground, giving them money. Because he's formerly incarcerated, because he's a part of that community, he knew who to give the money to, right? So then you have uh, corporations, tech corporations like Checkers, right? So Checkers, who does uh, background checks, has now taken a pledge to do 1% hiring um, as far as a formerly incarcerated community. And most importantly, one of the not most importantly, but very importantly, they hired Ken Oliver to lead their organization on fair chance hiring. 
right? He is formally incarcerated. And so even though with his team that are folks that are not formally incarcerated as well, but he's able to bring that real life experience that can say, um, uh, hey, you know, it's one thing to hire folks, but we also do need to, you know, do skill development. We also need to think about the emotional aspect and so forth. And so people who are coming home, yes, we want to work. And guess what? I have the most talented, most genius mind individuals I have met behind those walls. So they're meant more to just like work on your side of the road and pick up trash and like hard body labor. You know, they deserve to be sitting in this room and being in the tech offices with you. And we're a part of the community. And so it's like, how can we bridge that gap? And again, uh, reach out, you know, to be a leader in the organ these corporations, these tech spaces, and saying, you know what, hey, I'm gonna do the start with a 1% pledge. Because you give people a job, resources, that gives them confidence. And not only does it change them, it also can break like generational uh, curses. And so. I wrote down the people who are closest to the pain are closest to the solution. I think that's really profound. So thank you. Um, in the oh, <laughs> still beautiful nonetheless. <laughs> um, in the remaining few minutes that we have, um, I would love to tee up the trailer of being free for the first time. So please turn your attention to the screen for our trailer. Where do you see yourself in the next five years? Um. I can't tell you where I'm gonna be at in five years. It's five years ago, I was in prison. The anxiety about being released back into the streets is there. Like, am I good enough? Am I gonna make it? Reintegrating back into society, unfortunately, it's not that easy. It's a little traumatizing after being pulled away from it so long. Where am I gonna live? Where am I gonna work? That was my prison ID. That's what I was known for for the last 18 and a half years while I was in there. There is no way that I could just rewind and somehow, some way, make everything better again. The option that I'm left with is starting today, being in the moment, being present. So we are formerly incarcerated individuals going around the southern region of the U.S. interviewing folks who have been affected or are affecting a formerly incarcerated population. Media has placed this stigma on us that people inside prison, they're thugs, they're uneducated, all these misconceptions. So maybe just bringing awareness to that. It's such a hard thing to do, to do time in prison, right? It's easy to become discouraged. There were moments when I thought maybe I would never get out of prison. Folks in prison are telling you that your life is over, that you're never gonna be anything. Don't believe any of that. I felt like I was wrong with all that time because I had a 33-year sentence for five ounces of marijuana. But you could either get bitter or better. We know that our legislation is outdated, and we just know that more has to be done. It won't just come if we're mad about it. It won't just come if we're hopeful about it. we got to be intentional and deliberate. Because we can sit here and reimagine how we want community to be, how we want the world to be, but in order for that to happen, we got to be that change because we want to keep our people out of these systems. What are we going to do to turn this pain into purpose? Like, uh, down so we can really get the full I, don't, I don't really do the selfies, but. There's many individuals that I've met that are still in prison that also deserve to be here with me. I feel the warmth of freedom. I didn't think I was going to have that. We shouldn't be anomalies. It shouldn't be, oh, you're a formerly incarcerated attorney. How interesting, how great. Let it be inspiring, but let it become the norm. To get out of that box that society's placed you in. And when I say box, I'm not talking about the prison cell. I'm talking about that psychological, spiritual, mental block that all of us went through at some point in our life and gave up hope about having something better. Hearing these people's stories, they all have come from similar circumstances that I have come from. Man, some beautiful things can happen when you just believe in people and give them tools and resources. And that's really what the movement work is about. How do we move the needle? How do we change people's ideas about who formerly incarcerated people are? We got some work to do, and you all are equipped to do it. Three weeks on this RV, we can help change the narrative. 
It's an opportunity to really be true and real with one another. Be human, be free. Yeah, shout out to Craig. We gotta give Craig his. Yeah, Craig, Craig, Craig did a great job. Craig was the director. So. Yeah. Yeah, Craig P. Craig P. <laughs> Craig's our director. <laughs> Oh, man. Um, thank you all for being here in person. If you would like to continue this conversation, um, in 10 minutes, we are actually going to be headed to the skyline on the 32nd floor um, to continue hearing from London Cordero and Hugo about their experiences on the road trip. And since the road trip has ended, and in addition, we're going to be showing some more exclusive content from the film. So we'd love to see you there. If you could please give it up one more time for our amazing panelists.